Now, Schumann, I've heard he had bipolar disorder. Interesting question, because it's really difficult doing retrospective psychiatric diagnoses on historical figures. Sure. I have enough difficulty getting it right with... <laughs> with live patients. With, with live, exactly. <laughs> but Schumann wrote letters which really clearly lay out a sense of mania. He said, I feel so pressured, I feel in a divine mood, I'm so overflowing with sounds, that if I could just have scribbled them all down, I would have composed a hundred symphonies. That sounds like a manic episode. Sure. There were also long stretches where he didn't compose at all. Mm. Because when he was depressed, he not only had trouble concentrating, but he had diminished energy, felt hopeless, had suicidal thoughts. He had this delusional conviction that he was actually a worthless composer. He suffered. He suffered. He suffered enormously. He invented two imaginary companions to comfort him during times of stress. Mm. And he called them Eusebius and Florestan. Eusebius, a melancholic, introverted, poetic dreamer. Florestan, by contrast, was an aggressive, impetuous, frenetic individual. Probably not too much of a stretch to suggest that Eusebius represented the depressive side of Schumann's persona, and Florestan represented the manic side. Now, you know, the presence of imaginary companions, very common amongst children. When grown-ups conjure up imaginary companions, it's either a sign of a very active imagination or a warning sign that psychosis is imminent. Mm -hmm. In Schumann's case, it was a sign of both. Yes. Wow. Fortunately, there's a piano in the library's main hall, because Richard is the only psychiatrist in the world who's a Schumann expert and a Juilliard-trained concert pianist. That is from a piece called Floriston, from Schumann's Piano Suite Carnival. The whole piece, Carnival, is based on a wildly imaginative premise. He composed it when he was 25. He was engaged to a woman named Ernestine. Ernestine came from a town called Osh. Osh is spelled A-S-C-H. And Schumann noticed that those letters in Osh were also letters in his name, in the name Schumann. Mm -hmm. They were the only four letters in his name that corresponded to musical notes. This is A here. And S in German is E-S or E-flat. So this is S. This is C. And H is the German counterpart to the note B. So that's H here. So Schumann played around with these letters, with these notes, A, S, C, H, A, S, C, H. And he came up with them. He said, all right, that's one thing I could do with the A, C, H. And he, he, he thought to himself, well, what else? A, S, C, H, and he invented. And he continued thinking to himself, well, A, S, C, H, and he came up with. To take four kind of random notes yeah. and do that, that's Cer unbelievable. It's certainly not how other people were composing music at this time. His contemporaries thought the piece was incomprehensible. Chopin, for instance, who was born the same year as Schumann, Chopin, the great Polish composer, he said that he did not even consider Carnival to be music. <laughs> so, actually, let me share with you some of what contemporary music critics said. An affectation of originality, a superficial knowledge of art, the absence of true expression, and an infelicitous disdain of form has characterized every work of Robert Schumann. Mm. They're uncouth, faded, and wanting in clearness. Mm. Now, this would be neither the first nor the last time that a great piece of music was not immediately appreciated as such. The imaginative leaps of the truly creative mind often take years, sometimes even decades, to be appreciated and enjoyed. And I feel that it actually is important to understand Schumann's mind in order to appreciate his music.